who will he choose? That's what everybody's wondering. At least all the fans of The Bachelor. We got home last week, I sat down on the couch after work, turned the TV on, just gonna watch a show and relax. I saw that the last show that had been watched was the premiere of The Bachelor. <laughs> oh, Stella. <laughs> There's still time. It's okay. For those of you who are not familiar with The Bachelor, there's uh, 30 women come together on this reality TV show. Uh, they go on a series of dates with the one eligible bachelor. And they make the show very interesting with all kinds of drama and exotic locations, uh, all these like expensive dates and gourmet meals. And then they have the elimination, which they try and dress up and they just call it a rose ceremony, but it's still an elimination. No doubt that the millions of people who will turn in uh, tune into The Bachelor this uh, season, already have their list going of the ladies that they think might actually find true love, and also their list of ladies that they think they just put on there uh, for the ratings and all the drama that they'll probably create. Uh, fans of the show, though, and The Bachelor, and I'm sure all of the women do hope that by being on the show that they will find true love. Everybody's wondering who The Bachelor is going to choose. We have a much more important choice in front of us today, a much more important question about true love. Today we ask ourselves, would God choose to love us? In our first reading from 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel was very upset about the last season of The Bachelor. No, that's not true. That was a joke. <laughs> no, Samuel was born about 3,000 years before The Bachelor ever even aired, but he is upset. In our opening verse from 1 Samuel 16, Samuel is upset. He's upset because of Israel's king, Saul. Saul was the first king of God's nation of Israel. He was anointed to be the king by Samuel. Samuel was the last king judge, and so it was his duty to anoint the next king. The judges were the term, and that's where the name of that book of the Bible, Judges, comes from, it was the term of the leaders before Israel started to have kings. But Israel had grown tired of having judges lead them. More so, they were tired of God being their king. So they came to Samuel and they said, we want an earthly king. We want a man to be our king so that we can be like all of the other nations. God told Samuel that Saul would be the next king. And it was a logical choice. In 1 Samuel 9, we hear that Saul was as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and that he was a head taller than anyone else. Seems like a good choice for king, also probably a good choice for the bachelor. <laughs> Tall, good-looking. Things started off well for Saul as king. He listened to God. God gave him some military victories, and then everything went south. Saul stopped trusting in God. He began to idolize himself, and he became a liar, which I understand also makes for good reality TV. Somebody that has those qualities. But I digress. Everything started off well for Saul as king of Israel. And then God asked him to do something. It was pretty simple. God asked Saul to totally destroy Israel's enemy, the Amalekites. Saul went out, waged war against them, and he destroyed most of the Amalekites. Saul ended up saving some of the best of the sheep and cattle and also kept their king, Agag, alive. Well, that means he didn't listen to God. God said to totally destroy this enemy of Israel, but Saul had saved some of the best things. And when God told Samuel to go confront Saul about this, Saul said, I was just saving the good stuff because I was going to give it as a sacrifice to God. But regardless of his intentions, Saul had failed to obey what God told him to do. And so God rejected Saul as king of Israel. Then he told Samuel to go and anoint a new king of Israel. 
Samuel was upset by what Saul had done. He was in mourning for Saul and for his nation, for God's people, Israel. But God told him to get up. He had a plan. He had someone who he wanted to be the next king of Israel. So he tells Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. At that time, kings were anointed or set apart for their special position by having oil poured over their heads. Doesn't sound very pleasant, uh, but that marked them for their specific position. The most comparable thing I could think of today is teenagers that douse themselves in body spray or perfume before the school dance in hopes that that will set them apart from the others, which is not a good idea. So Samuel was sent uh, with oil, and he was supposed to anoint one of Jesse from Bethlehem's sons to be the next king of Israel. Samuel listens to God. He goes. But the people are still a little bit nervous. Samuel, being the judge, Samuel, just having this fallout with Saul, he still carried a lot of clout. The people were nervous in Bethlehem that Samuel was there. But he said, oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm here in peace. I just want to offer a sacrifice. But that was a cover so he could have Jesse come to him and he could see all of his sons and God would point out which son was going to be the next king of Israel. When Jesse gets there with his sons, Samuel sees his firstborn, Eliab. Good looking guy, tall guy. Samuel thinks this has to be the next king. But God rejects him saying the Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Listening to God, Samuel has the other sons of Jesse come before him. Six more sons, but God rejects all of them. Imagine there was a little awkward moment there uh, when Jesse said, There's nobody else here. Samuel asked him, do you, do you have any other sons? He says they're still the youngest, but he's tending the sheep. So they sent for him, and then they waited for the youngest son to come. And when he got there, God said, anoint him. And so Samuel anointed David to be the next king of Israel. God's choice of David confused everybody that was there. But that's because God doesn't make decisions like we do. If any of us were standing there with Samuel and Jesse and all of the other brothers, David would have, would have been our last choice. Jesse doesn't even call him by his name. He just says, oh yeah, we left the youngest one behind. Figured you wouldn't even have considered him to be the next king. He's too young. He's too inexperienced. He's eighth in line to inherit anything from his father. In fact, the description that we get from Samuel of David is that he was healthy and handsome. This isn't a beauty contest like for the homecoming king. This was to be a real king, like a king that leads armies, a king that leads nations. Nobody thought that David, the youngest, the little shepherd boy, should be the next king of Israel. But God does not make decisions like we do. God does not look at our outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. Now, you and I didn't come here today to figure out if God was going to choose us to be kings or queens. But we do all wonder if God chooses to love us. We wonder because we know that God doesn't look at the outer appearance. Instead, God looks at the heart. It'd be easier if we knew that God looked at our outer appearance or the things that we do and say if that's what he based his decision on to choose to love us. We have a little bit more control about how we present ourselves. It's a lot like The Bachelor. Ladies come and they bring all these fancy dresses and they can mind their manners sometimes. They can put on a good face and, and try and make it an easy choice for the bachelor to choose them to be the one that they love. But that's not how God looks at things. It's more like towards the end of the show, when they finally do uh, home visits. That's when it gets real interesting. When there's only a few contestants left on The Bachelor. Then they go home and see the families. Oh boy, that's some fun TV right there. 
Then all the things come out and they realize, this is what my life could look like if this is my choice. That's how God looks at us. He sees our heart. In Galatians 5, Paul wrote, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what God wants to find in our hearts and lives. That's what he's looking for, not just in Christians, but of everybody. Now, if you ask some of our acquaintances, maybe people that we work with or some people from school, people that aren't in our inner circles, they might say that all of us have a lot of or maybe even all of those qualities. We're nice and kind and considerate and patient and gentle and all kinds of nice things, but those are acquaintances. They only know our outer appearance. A lot of times where we can pull it together in public. But again, God looks at the heart. So God really looks at us as if it were a home visit. Now, if you ask our family if we're always loving or patient or kind or gentle or self-controlled, it's probably a different story there. And especially if we look at ourselves in the mirror, we have to answer that, no, we are not all of these things. Instead, when God looks at our heart, he sees hearts filled with regret and guilt and worry and fear when we look at God's law, when we look at his expectations for us. David describes what our hearts feel when we see God's law in Psalm 51. David said, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, God, against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David's words capture what is in all of our hearts when we see God's law. It makes it a very obvious answer when we ask ourselves, would God choose to love us? The obvious answer is no. If God's choice to love us depended on what he sees in our hearts, then we are lost. But the good news is that God's choice to love us does not depend on what is in our heart, but is what is in his heart. In our second reading from Titus 3, Paul wrote, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. We are not loved because of what God sees in us, but we are loved by him because of the mercy he showed to us. He chose to save us by sending Jesus to be our Savior. Today is the first Sunday after Epiphany. Epiphany, again, is another word for a revealing, an appearing. God shows us that Jesus is our Savior, that he is the Son of God. He is that unique, promised Savior for us. Today is also when we read about Jesus' baptism. In our gospel lesson from Luke 3, we read that when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. But this happened, something that never happened with anybody else. While Jesus was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven came and said, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus did not need baptism. God was already pleased with him. God already loved him. He had no need for baptism because Paul tells us the purpose for baptism is to wash away our sins. He tells us that in Acts, in 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, here in Titus. If the purpose of baptism is to wash away sins and Jesus has no sin, then there was no need for him to be baptized. Instead, he does it to fulfill all of God's commands. God wants all of us to be baptized. He did this so that God could have mercy on us by sparing us from the punishment our sins deserve. And instead, to punish Jesus. To offer him as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, as Paul says in Romans 3. In mercy, then, God can look at us and be pleased with us. God looks at us and loves us because he's no longer looking at our hearts, but at Jesus' perfect heart. 
heart that atoned for us, that paid for our sins through his sacrifice. God's choice to love us based on what Jesus has done brings us comfort. See, in relationships with one another, if we choose to love somebody else, it often leads us to do some interesting things. Love can make us do strange things because we want to do all that we can so that that other person chooses to love us. Even if it means fudging the truth, even if it means doing things that we don't normally do, we want that other person to choose to love us. See, in, in our relationship with God, the beauty is that that's all taken away. It doesn't depend on us. Whether we try to do a, a lot of good things or whether we have failed at so many things, it, it doesn't depend on what we've done. It depends on God. Because God loves us for Jesus' sake. God loves us because his son Jesus saved us. As the writer to the Hebrews says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. God's love for us is not a choice like finding a spouse. God's love for us is more like loving a family. Love by blood. We are Jesus' brothers and sisters, as Paul wrote in Ephesians. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Jesus bought us back with his blood, and he brought us into his family through our baptism. In our baptism, God makes us his own. He makes us his own children, a part of his own family, by putting his name on us. Our sins are washed away in the water, and we're baptized in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In John's Gospel, he writes, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature, and we go on to sin in our lives. But when we are baptized, it is the Holy Spirit that causes us to be born again. It is God's work for us. It is the Holy Spirit that creates in us a new spirit of life. A spirit of life given to us by God as a gift. So in baptism, then, God makes us his choice. When Samuel first saw David, he did not seem like the right choice to be the next king of Israel. But God could see his heart. God had brought David to faith in him. God knew that David would trust in him to lead him in his life. God would be the one to give David guidance. God would be the one he would turn to when he sinned, when he needed forgiveness. David then would also trust God to be the leader of Israel, that God would be the strength of Israel, no matter what enemies faced them. And even in his personal life, when David fell into horrible sins, he turned back to God and asked for forgiveness. Later in Psalm 51, David writes, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity, confident that God wants to turn away from our sins. He wants to give us forgiveness. David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. God, you are the one that creates a new heart inside me. Do it for me. Fulfill your promises. Renew a, sp a steadfast spirit within me. God alone is the one that changes our hearts to trust in him. God chooses to love us because of what he has done for us through our Savior, through our baptism. When we ask that question today, would God choose to love us? This isn't a, a question like, who will he choose on The Bachelor? This question has everything for us. This is, will God, the creator of everything, choose to love me? And the good news is that God chose to love all people through Jesus. This epiphany season, God reveals himself as our Savior. He reveals that he was baptized for us. Last week, he reveals that he's a God that chooses to bring believers from all nations. Even the Magi that came from the Far East are part of God's kingdom. 
Jesus is our king. He was born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph, descendants of King David born in Bethlehem. Jesus is not only the rightful heir to the throne of physical Israel, but to the Israel of all believers. And you are his own through your baptism. As we continue to read in Titus 3, our second reading, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. As baptized children of God, we will live with him forever in heaven, as heirs together with Christ as his brothers and sisters. We'll live there confident, confident that we are saved, that we are loved by God through his word, through baptism, through what Jesus has done for us. We have all confidence that Jesus chose to love you. Amen.